Okay. Well, we uh, we've really enjoyed our time here. We appreciate you guys standing with us and uh, sowing into our ministry, allowing us to sow into your ministry. We pre- we praise God just for the giving and receiving in the body of Christ. Uh, we appreciate uh, those of you that are here that are not able even to give financially. That's not why we're here. We're just uh, excited to be able to sow into your lives and to see the multiplication come forth uh, in in your life. Uh, part of the beauty of the body of Christ is that those that are able to give and to and give by faith are able to make it possible for those that are not able to give financially uh, to receive what they need in the Word to be built up so that uh, as time progresses that uh, that uh, that everything uh, shifts in the kingdom and that you're able also to give uh, when you have an abundance as well. So anyway, we're excited. I, I'm, I'm really excited about some of the con- conversations that I was drawn into because I saw some people people going, oh man, I'm liking what I'm hearing here. This uh, Someone met me in the hall and said, this makes everything so simple. Why is it that we make everything so complicated? Uh, and, uh, you know, I would amen that. You know, it, it is a very simple process. Uh, when you can focus on making disciples, like a couple of people, you know, and then your job is to help establish them and who they are in Christ, right? To help them experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to help them be able to heal the sick, to prophesy, to share their testimony, right? And you get in their back pocket on their turf, wow, it becomes a very powerful thing that can multiply over and over and over and over. Um, And so, you, uh, the, uh, one of the things that uh, that uh, was asked, why is it that we do things so different now? <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I'm I'm not I'm going to share the answer for that that I see, uh, but as I share it, I don't want you to be offended, okay? Because um, I, I I don't believe that people are intentionally you know waking up in the morning and saying you know hey what can I do to to mess up the church and make it uh, powerful powerless and and slow it down and make it mediocre or whatever. I just honestly believe that for the most part, people are doing the best they can with the revelation that they've received and uh, and and that there is value. I, when I do my ministry, I don't try to talk people out of their buildings or out of uh, meeting as congregations. I don't believe there's any need for it because for the most part, the things that happen on Sunday mornings are valuable. The word is preached, uh, Jesus is worshipped, uh, and and that. And And God's people get together, they encourage one another and build one another up. So you don't have to fight against, uh, you know, Sunday morning worship services for the, uh, and there was, to me, like, what's the point of that? Um, But what we need to to do is to realize, to not call that church, (laughs) to not say that that's all that church is. Because what church is, Jesus said that on this rock I will build my church. And he's talking about the revelation of who he is. Is that God the Father gave to Peter, um, and and the and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So the church, the Greek word is ecclesia or ecclesia. However, your pastor says is probably right because I don't speak Greek. So I'm not going to fight with people about how to pronounce Greek words because I don't speak Greek anyway. So however you want to say it, you can cross stitch that on your pillow with your accent. Okay, uh, but for me, the issue is what was that? Those were the people that were called out from the average Joes. They were called out of those people to exercise government over a region. And so we are those that have been called out of the world to exercise the government of the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ came with a government on His shoulders. He brought the kingdom of God on His shoulders. And we have been called out to exercise that government over the region. Amen? Uh, And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So what is it that Jesus uh, experienced His church? To me, it was something very beautiful. You had 12 people who were living their lives, called out from what they used to be, called out from what they were to live with Jesus, to be on mission with Jesus, to follow Him, to learn from Him, to become like Him. Jesus said when a disciple is fully trained, he will be just like his master. So that's what they were learning. They didn't even like one another. They just love Jesus. Do you understand that, that you know when you know you're in real church when you look around and realize, man, I would not be friends with any of these people. 
<laughs> I, the reason that I'm here is because I love Jesus and they love Jesus and we're and that's what's brought us together. It's not about liking each other. It's about loving Jesus and becoming like Him. And sometimes the way to become like Him the best is to be around people you don't even like. <laughs> but they love Jesus and they're going the same direction as you. They may not like the same music you like. They might not have the same background. You wouldn't have anything in common. But what you've got in common is Jesus Christ. Amen? That makes all the difference. And these people (coughs) lived with Christ as the center on the kingdom mission together. Amen? Now, Jesus in bodily form was taken out from their midst and He moved inside of each one of them. And that's church. It's what they had been experiencing for three years. Living together with Christ as the center of their lives. And that never changed. It just changed location. It moved from outside to inside. Do you see that? And that's what got multiplied. That's what church was. I'm now moved from being discipled on the outside to being discipled on the inside. That's Ephesians 4. You have received and have been taught the truth which is in Jesus Christ, if indeed you have heard Him. Amen? You are hearing Jesus Christ. You are learning the truth that is in Him. And so Jesus now has made it possible for Him to individually disciple each one of His people. But part of that process is not just that you have Jesus, but that we have Jesus together. Amen? And so uh, it's not that He's just inside of you. He's also inside of me. So the truth that I've received, I can pass on to you so that we can accelerate your ability to hear what He's saying. And there will be a witness in the Spirit. You have an anointing that abides, that teaches you the truth. Amen? And so we, as we share one to another the truth that we have in Jesus, we can help one another to accelerate our becoming like Jesus Christ. So, now, there is a, there's a distraction that, that came in, honestly, because I believe that the church, as it was left and as it was given on, was, was, a, was disciples making disciples making disciples. And so when they came together, it was a gathering of disciple makers and disciples who were making disciples. Uh, and that gathering was, looked very dynamic. Uh, and it was a lifestyle that they had in common. And they would never call just that the church. That would be the assembling, right? But the church was what they were doing. All, that's who we are. It's not where we go. It's what, we, what we've become. We've become the governing people. Right? So we are the church in the region. So it's not something you go to, it's something you've become. And it's you live out 24-7 and you do it together. Right? You stay connected even during the week and you are advancing the kingdom. Christ is in the center, you're on mission with each other. You're, Christ is the center, you're on mission with each other to advance the kingdom wherever you go. And sometimes you get a chance to come all together. And you encourage one another, you build one another up even more and more. Um, and so... Some people were asking me some specific questions of how does that relate to life teams and how does that relate to this and um, you know and I don't have all the answers for that. Those those questions are above my pay grade to be honest with you. And I think that's part of the flexibility that we have in the body of Christ. Is it doesn't have to be like you know there's one size fits all answers. Amen. Uh, Jesus, his ministry was very dynamic. He he filled hillsides, didn't he? And, uh, and so he did, a, he did large group meetings, he did public meetings, but he had some people with him that he was pouring into in a different way. Uh, and they, he sent them out in Luke chapter 9, and they did ministry, and then right away there was the 72. So it didn't all look the same. Now one of the things that, that we found in our life team is that I began to treat my life team like Jesus uh, discipling uh, His 12. Okay, I started looking at that instead of it that I'm discipling them, that I'm equipping leaders who are becoming disciple makers. So I started looking beyond the people that I'm directly influencing, and I started thinking about equipping them to, to impact others. And it started affecting the way that I started interacting with them. Uh, it started impacting 
impacting the way that I thought of them. So it was no longer about me having a good group. Because, and here's the neat thing about it. It was like I didn't even have a ministry anymore. I didn't think of my ministry. I didn't think of the group as my ministry. I thought of their ministry. How can I equip them for their ministry? So it was like I lost my ministry. And all of a sudden, the only thing that was important was equipping them to be successful in theirs. And so, wow, it was like all of a sudden things shifted. And so that led me to say, okay, what could I do? Because there were some people in my group that were that believed and walked out what I had passed on to them. But to be honest with you, they weren't uh, going to anytime soon be able to be near as effective at communicating and teaching that truth uh, as, I, as I would be, right? So that, that was the area of stumbling. And so that's why I developed my, my discipleship manuals so that they could have something in front of them that they could say, hey, let's just read this together and go through it. And it's kind of a self-guided thing. Now, you don't have to use my discipleship manuals. You can use any content that is kingdom equipping and plug and play, right? Um, But you need to beware of the methods that you use because the methods that you use need to be something that can multiply and be pass-onable. That's why I call it pass-onable. That's not exactly even a word. But I I made that up because, uh, but, but you understand what I mean, right? Let me give you uh, a counter example of this. Um, uh, when I was a missionary, and somebody asked, "Well, what's the background? How did you how did you come up with all this stuff?" Well, some of it I didn't come up with on my own. Some of it, the, the Luke ten uh, principles, I learned from other missionaries who had been successful in launching moves of God in people groups to up to that point were thought to have been resistant to the gospel. And when it turned out, what they were resistant to was not the gospel, but they were resistant to church. Christianity. They were resistant to the packaging that we had wrapped the gospel in. And so when people move towards bringing the kingdom through and advancing it through the context of not creating institutions, but making disciples. See, there's a difference between being a clergyman and making a congregation, which is institutional, and being a disciple who's making disciples. One's very relational. The other one is, it looks like an institution. And we have typically merged the two. And when you go to seminary, you're typically taught how to become a clergyman who makes congregations, which can be a distraction to being a disciple maker, right? Uh, the methods are very different. Um, the, the, the ways of communicating things are very different. So one of the things that God began to deal with me about was your strengths can make other people weak. What do I mean? If all I do is spend my time talking, you become really equipped at listening. Right? But if my job is to get you activated in ministry, I need to shut up at some point and allow you to actually start doing things. I can't just say, come and listen, come and learn, come and listen, come and learn, come and listen, come and learn. I actually have to give you opportunity to, now you do it, now you do it, now you do it. That's why Curry has implemented the life teams, right? Because it's important to get the Word, but then you need to have an opportunity to be the doers of the Word. Amen? Uh, And so that's really important. Uh, The the thing that I've uh, observed uh, sometimes, though, is that uh, oftentimes when when you go from a camp, the campus, into to the home, and this is not just life teams, this is just in general, that we have the tendency to reproduce in the home or on the small scale what we're used to seeing in the big scale, right? So you end up going into somebody's home and then they preach a sermon at you, okay? Or you feel like that's that's what you're supposed to do because that's what you've observed ministry to be. Um, and I'm not saying that that's wrong if that's what you've done, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, but what I want to encourage you is that sometimes you need to take a look at the method that you're using um, because part of what uh, has been part of, of, of launching disciple-making movements is what, what have been called participatory methods, meaning that people actually are participating.
participating, that you get people involved in their, in their learning. They're not just listening to a lecture, but they're actually there's an interaction that takes place so that they, there's a guidance, uh, but the scriptures themselves become the teacher and that uh, everybody's involved in, in calling out the observations, the principles, the applications, sharing what, this, what they understand from that, that kind of thing, uh, so that there's actual adult learning taking place, right? I'm an active learner. You're not just telling me uh, what it says, but that I'm reading it and I'm going through the discovery process on my own, right? I'm not just being given a fish, I'm being taught how to fish. And so that's part of the reason that I wrote the manuals the way that I did, so, um, so that they would involve people and give them some guidance in, in making observations in the scriptures, but they themselves have to read it, they have to do their own ob- observing uh, with some guidance, etc. And then there's also the applications of the principles of the, this is what we need to do. So there, there's some method behind my madness, but what I've learned is you can use those same methods with other sorts of tools. Um, for example, uh, there's great uh, manuals that have been made with the JGLM, uh, uh, that, uh, like Laying Hands on the Sick is a, is a great manual. The Minnesota Life team that, uh, I w- that I've been mentoring from afar, I, I call it like, uh, what, shadow pastoring, you know? <laughs> you sort of in touch with the leaders, but I'm not actually leading anything, but I'm supporting them so that they can do it. So I got them set up doing some things, and, I, uh, and what, I, what I realized right away is that nobody felt confident confident like they had their arms around this method message yet. You know, they still had their own questions, but they knew enough, having gone through the DHT, they wanted to be doing it as they were still learning. So what I did was say, okay, this is what this is what we're gonna do. You're gonna go through laying hands on the sick together. You're gonna read a chapter a week. When you come back together, after you've finished what they do is they actually go, they meet in a public place like in a in a mall or something like that. They meet uh, at 7 o'clock at such and such entrance and as they come together they pair up and they go do ministry throughout the mall for an hour and then they meet back at the food court uh, for the second hour and part of what they do is they share highlights so what happened in the you know highlights from the outreach and from the last week and then uh, they they have some time to say okay let's talk about our lesson from the week so they've all read the lesson but here's the deal nobody teaches it they all teach it right? Here's how they do it. Uh, There's someone who facilitates it. They say, so, um, from what we read last week, what were some of the main lessons that you understood? Right? That was the what, the content. What did you understand? So now they have to say it out of their own mouth. You know, there's different muscles involved from reading it and, okay, I got it. And have you ever felt like that? You know, like, I know I believe this, but when it came to like actually explaining it to somebody, I felt like, blah, 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 you know, you just can't get it to come out. Well, that's part of the beauty of having a life team and having discipleship relationships is that you can ask the question. Do you notice that Jesus, oftentimes when he's interacting with his disciples, you know, he goes, so uh, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? You know, he's asking questions. He's trying to get them to say, you know, what's going on in their own heart. Um, You know, it's not that he never spoke. He did speak. But, you know, part of what we need to do is we need to equip people to be teachers, right? So, Part of that, so you have the what question. What did you understand so far out of that? What were some of the main lessons? And you have people go around, right? Uh, What else did you understand? What else? What else? What else? Okay, great. And then that's the what. Then there's the so what. Why? How should our lives be different if we live this out? Right? How should our lives be different? What should we do uh, to live this out? How does how should this make a difference in our life? You have the what and the so what, and you know what? They are telling one another how they should be living, what they should be doing. Right? And then you just say, "Great, go and do likewise." <laughs> you know? So they have a real simple uh, thing. There's content that's there, but they didn't have to become great teachers in order to get it. Uh, they, they, but they did have to be good learners, and they're becoming good teachers as they, as they ask what, was, what were the main lessons and what we, should we be doing about it. Um, and then, then they just kind of nail down, okay, so what are you going to do this week differently to apply this, right? And 
then so this week's assignment, so that's your assignment, great? So you don't have to, me from on high, give the assignment. You can suggest those things, but what, do you, what are you going to do? What's your assignment? What are you going to give to yourself this week? Do you need any help? Now that's where you, as the leader, become the servant, amen? How can I help you take those steps that, you're fi- that you might be finding difficult on your own? And so that might be a, a separate meeting, right? Not the whole life team, but that's a, that's a thing that you can do to help them. Or next week, you and I are going to be partners for the outreach, right? So that's, that's your job is to make everybody successful in taking those steps that they have, may have found diff- difficult on their own. Um, uh, and so this week's assignment becomes part of next week's highlight. So how did your assignment go from this, this week? Was it difficult? Did you find, you know, were you able to get some breakthrough? You know, so that, that keeps a bit of a flow and a little bit of accountability, right? We just didn't forget it. It was assignment, psh, went off into the air. You know, nobody ever finds out anything about it, how to go, no. But you have a little bit of an accountability, but it's not that heavy-handed accountability of like, you answer to me, right? It's... No, you set the goals for yourself. You answer to Jesus. And my job is just to be alongside of you for the ride to say, hey, how can I help you? How's it going? Because everybody wants to grow. Everybody wants to change. But changing is hard. (laughs) Changing's not easy. That's where we need to tap into one another and come alongside of one another so that, hey, you know what? This is a goal you set for yourself. I'm going to agree with that. And what can I do to help, right? We're not not like those that um, wrap up heavy burdens, put them on people shoulders and don't do a thing to help one another. Amen? We help people. We help them. That's part of what leadership is. It's servanthood. We take responsibility for others. So, um... All right, so that's part of how, uh, and so in our life team, uh, here's, here's the interesting thing that happened. I kind of described a little bit of this before, but I started looking at our life team as a group of, of leaders, of disciple makers. And so right from the beginning, once I put uh, our stuff in, in their hands uh, and, and, and we went through a couple of lessons, then I started to say, well, who do you know that's not here that you can begin to help walk in the full of Jesus Christ. Who would be willing, if you were willing to help them, that they would be willing to meet with you once a week or so, uh, so that you could go through these lessons. You know, people that you know. And people are, and, and I held myself to the same standard, right? It's not just do as I say, but also do as I do. So I challenged myself that I'm going to have someone outside of the group or some ones outside of the group that I'm also mentoring through the same process. Uh, uh, that's one thing that I, that that I encourage you. If you're going to be a leader, be an example. Don't be, don't just be telling people what you want them to do and what you think God wants them to do. If you're not willing to do it too, because those are the lessons that you're going to learn. That that, that as you receive grace from God, as you step, make those same steps, you're going to better know and better understand how you can really support and encourage and help other people. Because you're going to find the own needs in your own heart and your own lifestyle, things you have to overcome, and you're going to have a greater awareness. And the Holy Spirit will orchestrate your life so that if you weren't aware, He'll make you aware. <laughs> you know, you'll face that same wall, and it's going to look like a wall for you. Whereas what they went through didn't look like a wall for you, but you found a wall, and all of a sudden now you got to overcome that, and you're going to be, instead of being proud and belligerent, you know, like, well, why can't you overcome that? You know, just confess and do blah, blah, blah. You know, and you give it, you give them the truth they need, but you give it to them with attitude, you know, instead of with grace and mercy to actually help them because you went through that, that own brokenness that you had to go through to overcome some stuff in yourself. Now you, you, you're more like Jesus that you're, you're ministering, uh, with, with an awareness of the weakness of the flesh or whatever that, that you're actually able to minister it with grace. I didn't say it right, but I think you guys get what I mean. All right, so 
here's uh, here's how it worked is, is as I challenged people to do that um, they started asking people who, who can I who can I uh, who can I do this my wife she started taking two moms who had six kids apiece through this book uh, there was a, another young lady that she started taking her fiance her fiance started laying hands on the sick he started taking two vets uh, through this uh, there were two other people that were part of our group they started taking other people through it they ended up uh, uh, hosting a DHT in their church as a result of that because she had uh, started taking her pastor through this and gave him a book you know uh, and then they ended up hosting a DHT now they've got their own life team so it, at first it may not look like a life team it may just look like a few people getting together to have coffee who are helping one another grow into the fullness of Jesus but you think of your life team as disciple makers and that what in, though though it may look something uh, less than that that it can grow into that right but it's still the right thing if it never becomes a, a, a JGLM life team now you got two moms with six kids apiece I mean they're just they, they're living with that life team they got they got a life team of six day in day out you know that's planting seeds for the kingdom that are going to reap rewards for eternity forever so you know that's where we need to let the organization uh, you know uh, be subject to the kingdom and do what's right for the kingdom and you know the organization will grow and take care of itself you know it's it's a good thing so um, you know I don't I don't always think along the lines of, you know, that way. Um, but what you find often is that those people now uh, that were in our group that, that began to share with their pastor, now they've started their own life team and people are being exposed to JGLM. They're, they made the connection not through seeing Curry on, on YouTube, but by seeing the message that Curry preaches inside some people that they know. And now they're saying, oh yeah, and, and we love Curry and, we, and so they're starting to to become more aware of the JGLM message and ministry in that way. Um, so so everything, you know, you just stay focused on the kingdom. The relationships develop in the way that they need to. Amen? Uh, so hopefully that kind of helps a little bit and kind of fill some things out. Um, any questions or comments before I move on to our lesson? My gosh, I took 40 minutes to give you an introduction and wrap up last message thing. So, all right. Any questions, comments? Anything that was not clear or incorrect? All right. We got it. All right. Now, this is what I would like to do. Uh, I would like to show you this in Paul's ministry. Uh, very important. And then I'm going to give you some specific tactics. In Acts chapter 16, verse 27, on page 92 in the manual, uh, you see that Paul, it, his main method was the same method of Jesus to advance the kingdom by winning groups of people. Okay, Not just winning individuals, but looking at the individual as a member of a pre-existing group. So he was making it his goal from the beginning, not just to win individuals, but to find that person of peace and win groups, and the group that they're a part of. So when the jailer awoke, he called for lights and rushed in, trembling with fear, for, uh, and he fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Okay? Now, Paul and they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. So right from the beginning, Paul was not just talking and he was not just content for this man to be saved as an individual, was he? He was proclaiming that this gospel that I'm preaching to you, you is not only for you to be saved, but it's for your whole household. So right from the beginning, he's talking, he's, he's preaching the gospel in a way that is, is showing him this is not going to isolate you and separate you from your household, but what you're going to receive is going to bless your whole household. Do you see that? All right. So, and they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their wounds and they were baptized at once, he and all his family. So, what happened? Paul and Silas, they had to have left the jail and gone with the Philippian jailer to his house. So they they went to with the jailer onto his turf, didn't they? 
And, they, and, and so he became the link of connecting uh, Paul and Silas with those that he knew. So they, now they weren't just doing random acts of kingdom. Now they weren't just saving an individual, but they were actually launching a new move of God because they had the mindset that, that God wants, to, that these people are already connected and that the kingdom can flow into new pockets of relationships through the individuals we meet if we steward that relationship properly. Do you see how he did that? And, and Jesus did that very same thing. And so Paul is following that same example. And said they, uh, and how did discipleship take place? It started off with what? Paul preached, and they wanted to respond. And what was the response? Pray this little prayer in your heart. No, it wasn't. Get baptized. Water baptism was the start place. Does that sound familiar? Jesus said, go, make disciples. How do you do that? Baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So there started, the, the disciple-making process started with an all-in bodily demonstration of a faith that now my whole life is, my old life is submerged into the past, buried with Christ, and I'm raised up to become a visible demonstration that Jesus is Lord. Amen? And so often, we don't start discipleship where Jesus started discipleship. It takes us years to get people to the point where they break with traditions, where they overcome their own personal sense of inferiority, and am I, am I ready yet, and am I fully committed, and things like that. My, uh, my wife, Tina, she was discipling a lady uh, for, uh, who had a Chinese background, uh, and she uh, had come to faith in Jesus, but was tremendously insecure. And so Tina began to speak to her about the importance of demonstrating her faith through baptism uh, and the meaning of that. So she was preaching the gospel over and over again. Uh, and this lady was like, well, I never, I don't know if I believe enough. And all, there were so many things. And there was things that she would tell us about the Chinese culture and the way that the church was perceived there and all these things. But then she came to the point of just we showed her Mark chapter 16 Jesus said he who believes and is baptized will be saved so we showed her that we asked her what did Jesus say someone had to do before they got baptized you know what level of spirituality what level of character do they have to have in their life she says they only must believe and they said do you believe and she said yes so we said be baptized then Jesus doesn't say they have to have you know undone all this other stuff and so you need to act on the simple belief that Jesus is Lord and that I believe in him uh, and Jesus said he who believes and is baptized amen uh, and so we we shared that with her so many other times we've we've ministered to people and oh well I was baptized as an infant you know I, I was and I said really so you believed as an infant? No, I didn't believe in it as, as an infant. My parents did this. Uh, I said, well, okay, is that what baptism is in the Scripture? Let's take a look at that. Let's just read through this. You know, and, they, and I said, so where in the Bible is baptism that, uh, you know, you get a pretty little white dress as a baby and sprinkle a little them on your head so that, you know, the, uh, so that, that that's baptism? No, that's not baptism, is it? No, it's not. What is baptism? It's the first step of discipleship. It's, the, it's somebody saying, I believe that Jesus is Lord and I believe. And so I want to, with my body, with my faith, with my heart, I want to express that my whole life belongs to Jesus. I'm immersing myself into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm plunging into God. I'm coming out of the world and I'm plunging into God. And the old life that was apart from God is gone. The new life has come. And so... Look at all those things that have to get overcome. Personal insecurity, false teaching, traditions of men. They all have to be overcome for somebody to come to be baptized. Jesus wants people to start at that point. To start at that point. So I, I encourage you, start discipleship where Jesus starts discipleship. Don't just have people pray a little private prayer in their heart. Do they, can they call on the name of the Lord and be saved? Absolutely. Yes, if you call Him Lord... 
demonstrate it with baptism, right? Put the two together. Jesus did. Disciples did. Apostles did. And, and oftentimes we're trying to uh, stay out of Roman Catholic you know, doctrines and Protestant doctrines. And all that stuff came in later. All those fights about, you know, what if somebody you know, believes in their heart and they're really born again, but they never get baptized? You know, I say, well, forget about that. Somebody didn't preach the gospel to them right. <laughs> okay? Where they end up in heaven? You know, that's not even what I'm talking about. The Bible doesn't even worry about that stuff. Is baptism necessary? Well, for what? Is it an option? Jesus commanded it. Since when are His commandments options? Right? So we're so worried about where somebody ends up, whether they end up in heaven or whether they end up in hell, and God wants them living in the kingdom. Do you understand that? So it's not about heaven or hell and what somebody, the minimum requirements that somebody has to do in order to end up in heaven when they die. That's not the gospel. The gospel is about come out of living for yourself and on your own terms and live in the kingdom. And it starts with baptism. And baptism is necessary because Jesus commands it. Amen? It's, we're not going to make His commandments optional. And so, we'll let the theologians fight over stuff. I'm not a theologian to fight over stuff. I'm a disciple maker. How about that? Yes, sir. So, we on their turn, and we are discipling them. Yes. We be baptized. Yeah. What do we do that? Okay, very good question. He said, so we are disciple makers. We're on their turf and we're ready to, uh, for and they're ready to be baptized. Where do we do that at? There's a lot of options. One uh, is bathtubs, the other swimming pools, other jacuzzis. Uh, you know, I, you know, you do, the, sorry, what else? Lakes, oceans, rivers, uh, hotels. They have swimming pools. Uh, yes, sir. So all of those things. And if you want to, you can get into a church building. I'm not against church buildings. You understand that? Uh, but oftentimes, if you're not a member of that church or whatever, you know, it, it, there you're going to run into barriers. So I'm going to assume that you know that that's an option. Uh, and, and so, I, uh, you know, if you're on their turf, then the question is, uh, you can pose that to them. Let them solve the problem, right? Say so you want to get baptized. Where where do you, where would you like to get baptized? You know, do you have a river? Do you got a pool? You got a friend with a pool? You got a jacuzzi? You got a friend with a jacuzzi? You know, you want to just you know rip off the fire plug? You know, and I'll no, <laughs> jam you down a hole. What do you want to do? <laughs> well, when you said that, the first thing that did come to mind was the baptism. There you go. All right. So God gave you that answer already. So, so those are things that, that are good problems to start to, to think about. The other thing that I want to encourage you is, listen, who's authorized in this room to make disciples? Raise your hand. Okay. So who's authorized in this room to baptize people? You might not have thought of that before, but you need to understand that this is not something that Jesus gave to clergy. This is something that Jesus gave to disciple makers. Amen. Amen? So, if you win them to Christ, you need to baptize them. Yeah. Right? Amen. That's what I would say to you. I'm not going to say that you can't you know, bring them to a pastor. I won't put, there's no law on it. There's no, uh, no law that it has to be done a certain way. But I would at least say this, that you are authorized. You are authorized to make disciples and baptize them into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, so, there we go. Um, so here's, here's one of the things is that one of the ways you can reach their circle of influence is by connecting strong Christians with people on their turf. So you might be in here and, and you've only thought that you need to win your circle of influence. Okay, that's fine. But there might be some Christians that you can connect with and bring them onto your turf to help you in your circle. Amen? Uh, and, there, and there might be people that, that uh, are trying to win their circle, and you might need to suggest to them, hey, I'd love to come to your house. I'd love to come to the poker party. I'd love to come to the this or the that. Uh, you know, is there anybody in your family that needs to be healed or whatever? And you can invite, you can get onto to their turf. So we need to be connectors in the body 
body of Christ. Here's the other, here's the other principle that I'd like to suggest to you, that the plan A is whenever you reach one, that the default is to look for ways that you can get onto their turf and to win a group around them and start a new group. Right? So you're looking for ways that you can start new groups in new areas amongst new people groups, right? Uh, that that be the plan A. And plan B is if that opportunity does not exist or present itself or that you get involved on their turf and it turns out that as the kingdom is demonstrated, everybody hardens their hearts. Everybody becomes resistant. See, now uh, that's where the kingdom, the, the words on the other side, right? That he who loves his father father and mother more than me, you know, you got to love Jesus first and foremost, right? But let's do the ministry first, that you actually give them the kingdom and not just snatch people out. What would have happened if Paul and Silas, rather than saying, this message is for you and for your whole household, and, and the, the, the Philippian jailer says, well, if it's for my whole household, I want them to be saved too. Why don't you come to my house? And Philipp, Paul and Paul and Barnabas said, no, 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 you just invite them. We've, we've already rented a, a storefront here in Philippi, and uh, we're going to be having us uh, uh, a revival service uh, on, on Saturday nights and, uh, and Sunday night this week and you just invite your family to come and uh, when they come uh, we'll share with them then uh, you know in the Philippian jailer he goes home and says he starts talking about uh, you know coming to a service because I met some guys they told me that uh, there was this guy named Jesus who rose from the dead man it sounds like Star Trek you know and, and to them and they're thinking we got our gods what are you talking about we've, we've, we've had our family gods for years what's wrong with them you know and there's no 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 but they're wrong. They're false gods. What do you mean they're false gods? They're our family, you know. And all of a sudden now, you know, you got one little Christian, a lonesome little Christian. He can't get anybody up to the building where Paul and Silas are. And so now instead of the gospel feel, you know, actually advancing the kingdom, you got one little Philippian jailer instead of a church being left behind. Do you see the difference? That, that having a campus-oriented mindset it's not that campuses can't work or that they have no place. Because after a point, you got so many disciples, you can't get them all into a normal house. You can't get them all uh, into a, even a building this size. You're going to need stadiums if you do it right, you know. Uh, so I'm not uh, like this house church mindset. We just need to, you know, get back to the roots and do it in the houses. And then you end up being legalistic little, you know, <laughs> mindsets in houses. I, I'm not for that that but I'm for the kingdom okay and we we there's no law on us we can do whatever it takes to be most effective at advancing the kingdom and making disciples so whatever you're doing on Sunday morning you just keep doing it with all your heart enjoy worshiping God receive the word but go and make disciples don't leave it there and say that that was church meaning that that's all that's governing a region with the kingdom of God because it ain't right We've, we've got to bring the kingdom to everybody in the region. We've got to set the captives free. And you are not going to be able to do, do it on your own. Here's the neat thing about it. So when you start looking at it this way, Luke chapter 9, he sent out 12. Luke chapter 10, he sent out 72. Listen to this. The laborers for the harvest come from the harvest. The person of peace that invited you into their life so that you can connect with their friends. They hear everything you say. They watch everything they do. Guess where the 72 come from? They, they saw the kingdom. They become the next laborers because they're being equipped while they're watching you. Now here's the counter example. You now, everything you're doing, from the start to the finish, the way you meet people, the way you approach them and get involved in their lives, the way that you advance the ministry and advance the kingdom, everything you're doing is making a disciple. 
Because you're discipling them even before they become Christians. Because they experienced the way that you treated them. They experienced the, the power of healing. They experienced the, the methods that you use, so to speak, uh, to get involved in their life. That, uh, and to ask them, you know, who else do you know that, that needs this? And every now and again, you run into a Peter who goes, Hey, y'all stop whatever you're doing. The, there's a guy, a rabbi, just came to my house. My mother-in-law, she's been sick and on her deathbed. And she got up and cooked us dinner because this guy healed her. If you got anybody sick or needs healing, come on, come on. And so now everybody knows Peter. He wouldn't pull our legs like this. So now all of a sudden you got a move of God on your hand. Amen? Because there, you might not be really good at connecting. You don't have to connect with everybody. You just got to keep doing random acts of kingdom and find that person of peace that God's got for you. And then you get involved in their life, and all of a sudden, you little old you have launched a move of God in Dallas, in Plano, in wherever you live, that uh, now all those people that were outside of church and didn't think they'd ever go to church again, and may not even have a building with a clergyman, all of a sudden now the kingdom of God has come and it's saturated and permeated that area. I remember hearing a story one time that some missionaries, they wanted to see the, the, the native, the local leaders take responsibility quickly and begin to evangelize. So this was an unreached group of people. And so what they first did is that they came in and they didn't know the language very good, but they had the Jesus film. You know what that, you know, the Jesus film, it kind of goes by the gospel of Matthew campus crusade for Christ, I believe has taken ownership of it. And now they've, they've translated it into so many languages and it's been an effective tool and so they went in they had a generator they put up this big screen uh they show the jesus film uh and the jesus film led a number of people to receive christ the village leaders received christ and so then they begin to work with the village leaders and say now we've discipled you we want you to take responsibility to reach the villages this village this village this village and they say yes we will do that yes we will do that and so okay now we're leaving and so the ministry and the kingdom is in your hands and so we're going to be back in a month and we're going to check up on you and say okay great you know so now's the big sending off time they come back and, uh, okay, what's happened? Well, not, not yet. We're still growing, but we haven't. Have you gone to the next village? No, we haven't gone to the next village. And it kept going like this, month after month after month. Then finally they said, so why, you know, why are you telling us yes, that you want to go, that you're going to reach them, but you, you're not doing anything? And they said, we're still saving up money for our generator. <laughs> See, they thought once they got the gospel into the native language, that that would be all that's necessary, that they would figure out that you didn't have to do it exactly the way we did it, that, you know, you can just now, you can go and tell them. Well, they had never seen that before. You see? So we tend to, uh, to embrace the whole package of what's being done. And so we think that we can't advance the kingdom because we don't have a church building. Because we don't have a seminary degree. Because we don't have money. And those kind of things. And what I need to tell you is this. Is you have Jesus. You have the kingdom. You have an open heart. You have the power of God. You have the gospel. That's the power of God for salvation. You can use whatever you've got at your hands, but you don't need those things. What you've got, you need. Or what you need, you've got. Amen? Well, it's getting towards the end of the day, and I'm just twisting my tongue. Y'all figuring it out quicker than I have. All right, so you understand that? All right, so here's, uh, here's what um, we're going to do. I want to take a 10-minute break, and then we're going to come back. I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to have one little activity together. I actually intended to get into that this time. I apologize. I'm not, I want it to be more interactive, hands-on. Uh, and then uh, we're going to, uh, what I'd like is to have a conference evaluation. I've got a conference evaluation form. I'd love your feedback. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up, okay?